welcome to a Podstemology. Epistemology. You know what I like a lot more than materialistic things? Knowledge. What is this? It's a podcast. Good morning, good day, and good evening to everyone, regardless of what time you're tuning in. Thanks for joining me for another episode of a Podstemology. And if you're new to the show, welcome. My guest this week is Nathan Lane, Associate Professor of Economics at Oxford University and Founder and Fellow at the Sodar Labs of Monash University. Our topic is industrial policy. In what ways can governments, especially in developing countries, intervene in the economy to promote desired economic ends? Industrial policy has something of a checkered history. In the post-Great Depression and post-World War II years, it was widely regarded as an obviously good thing, even by neoclassical economists. Indeed, Paul Samuelson, perhaps the founder of neoclassical economics, fully expected the Soviet Union to eventually overtake the economy of the United States due to the superiority of its central planning approach. We then saw a big reversal in the 1970s amid stagflation, butter mountains, wine lakes, and the other blighted fruits of price controls, subsidies, and tariffs that defined industrial policy in that era. The Chicago School's neoliberal agenda saw industrial policy widely panned and policymakers let the market rip. In some cases, notably Australia and China, that worked quite well, in part because the state retreated from things the market was good at, but not from things that the state was good at. In other cases, neoliberalism was a bit more of a disaster. And so, nowadays, we see something of a revival in industrial policy, especially with climate change demanding major economic restructuring. But this industrial policy is less muscular and more market-friendly than that of the 20th century. Nathan is here to tell us all about these nuances and help us better understand the history and future of industrial policy. Please make him feel welcome. Apodstemology. Hi, Nathan. Welcome to Apodstemology. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. It's great. It's great to be here. It's great to be on. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about your research interests? What gets you motivated? Yeah. So lately, I'm, I'm kind of like really knee deep in industrial policy, you know, how, how states, how, how governments try to affect the structure of the economy and whether they can do so. Um, but in general, I'm, I'm kind of uh, interested broadly in, in the political economy of development, you know, how, how political okay. institutions and states kind of shape the trajectory of growth and, and how countries and economies evolve. I think broadly, that's that's the kind of stuff that makes me excited. Mm -hmm. And are you mostly an economic historian? Is that how you describe yourself in as a subfield? Yeah, that's, it's a tough one. It's like, because I have a bit of identity crisis. I think there's right. a lot of people kind of in economic history who kind of feel that, that a bit of a, a bit of identity crisis there. Um, mm -hmm. Cause a lot of us are, are probably also interested in growth or, mm -hmm. or, uh, economic development writ large and the questions of economic development writ large just at a like a longer in a longer and in, in the long run and, mm -hmm. and um or even the medium run and uh so so it's like yeah i think i'm, I'm a development economist i'm i'm my my heart is in economic history for sure mm -hmm. um but um yeah, it can be it can be a bit of an odd identity because economic history can be so very specific sometimes and, and kind of right. um, focus on very specific questions, especially in Europe. Especially, you know, people are very interested in, in uh, European economies and the European um, uh, um, experience of industrialization. Very much mm -hmm. kind of defines sometimes the parameters of what people think of as economic history. And right. uh, in terms of those parameters, I'm a little outside. Um, right. Yeah, but because you mostly work on Asia, or yeah, yeah. I'm really kind of interested in the global economy, um, mm -hmm. and of course, there's plenty of economic historians who are. But but when you think of like like if I go to an economic history seminar, what what like the, mm -hmm. the major things that come up are like these grand kind of like especially here where we are, yeah, yeah. industrialization of of, 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 of of the UK or Great Britain yeah. or or Western Europe or or you know, very you know, uh, US-centric questions as well. Mm -hmm. so, um, so when you're doing developing countries, you're a bit, uh, you're a bit outside of that. Um, you know, so, yeah. Okay, all right, cool. Well, maybe we'll come back to some questions of, industry, of uh, economic history, because I'm very interested in that, but maybe it's, it's a bit too much like the 
a topic for economists, not for a general audience. So maybe uh, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, why don't you tell us, please, then, what is industrial policy, um, particularly in the context of, of that you study it? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a tough thing because people have different kind of uh, definitions of it, and we think of um, broadly kind of intentional state action meant to kind of transform. Uh, the structure of an economy, mm -hmm. the type of economic activity that is occurring within an economy. Um, it's like very intentional state actions and policies meant to kind of shift what would otherwise happen in the economy, what would naturally arise mm -hmm. in the economy without that intervention. And so okay. it's very much like a, a state component to it, a political component to it, because it's, 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 uh, um, some political arm or some some apparatus of the state that's shaping this in, in an intentional way, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some examples of industrial policy? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on right now. Like, I, I think, it, you know, probably the most selling right now would be um, um, certain policies meant to, to like spur PPE production. In, All right. In, uh, amid COVID and things like this, like how, how do we get factories producing PPE goods ASAP um, mm -hmm. amid markets that aren't functioning, amid you know, supply chains that aren't functioning, or in the U.S. There's some very salient policies uh, Biden is pursuing around uh, um, semiconductors. Yeah. How, how do we domestic? How do we create a domestic? Um, semiconductor industry in, in the U.S. or things like the Green New Deal. How, how do we, how do we, well, Green New Deal can be an even bigger, an even bigger package. But part of that presumably is how do we, how do we, um, how do we incentivize uh, green economic activity of some sort? Mm -hmm. uh, shifts away from um, uh, carbon heavy or environmentally uh, uh, Pernicious. Pernicious, yeah, environmentally yeah. pernicious uh, economic activity of the past. Mm -hmm. The cold, uh, you know, like, uh, <laughs> the type of stuff that, that are, are uh, we're back in Australia. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Yes. Embarrassing for us. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Oh. So, and then, so what are some of the specific mechanisms that industrial policy employs? So, I'm thinking in terms of like price controls. So, at the moment in Britain, there's a lot of talk about gas price spikes. Um, yeah, in part because yeah. we have no lorry drivers because of Brexit. And so the government yeah. has said there will be no price rises. So obviously there's a strong price control. Is that industrial policy? Or what else? It can, is, be. Yeah. it can be part of, like, you think of industrial policies, like there's, there's like indeed like um, a somewhat overwhelming basket of, of policy levers that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that a country or state or government can appeal to in order to kind of... Um, uh, promote economic activity or incentivize certain types of economic activity or shift away from certain older forms of economic activity. And so, so price controls could, could presumably be, be one of those, one of those levers. Um, I think, you know, like the classic one would be tariffs or some, some type of uh, over protectionism mm -hmm. uh, is kind of a canonical form of, of, of industrial policy or but it can also be used for other ends, just like price controls. Price controls can be, of course, used for other ends. So it's a big basket of tools, and a lot of these tools can be used for a multitude of reasons, um, but they, they can often be used as for industrial policy aims to kind of incentivize certain economic activity. Um, but it gets tricky because a lot of them can have other uses. You know, price controls can have all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, uh, other other kind of like uh, pro-social concerns or, or, mm -hmm. or um, uh, price stability concerns of some sort um, that, that you know are beyond the purview of industrial policy. So, okay. Yeah. So, so it gets it gets kind of complicated because a lot of things can get called uh, just like the definition of industrial policy. Mm -hmm. The definition can be really squishy and can get really. Uh, uh, pe people sometimes talk about industrial policy without defining what they're talking about. Oh, and yeah. at the same time, at the same time, people can be talking about um, various policy levers uh, as though they are uh, implicitly industrial policy, which mm -hmm. isn't always the case. You know, like tariffs, for instance, um, they might be used to, say, classically incubate uh, uh, 
infant industry, and mm -hmm. classic use of tariffs, but they can also be used for a multitude of other reasons. For instance, to just uh, if you're a low fiscal capacity state, to, to, mm -hmm. to be used for purely fiscal reasons, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, so you get into some some issues there, and that kind of complicates discussion of industrial policy because, well, the definition and the is squishy, and the the toolbox is 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 pretty big and, and pretty mm -hmm. complex and again, get, can kind of be deployed for many reasons that aren't industrial policy. Okay, great. So then uh, I know that this is, uh, I used to do a bit of industrial policy research in, in my past life as a development oh, economist. Yeah. And uh, I remember that it was, uh, I guess, fairly controversial within development studies. Um, and I think it's, uh, maybe I'm mischaracterizing it, but I'd say it's been through kind of some waves where uh, yeah. it was, I mean, at the very least kind of unpopular through the, uh, the end of the 20th century, um, yeah. at least among, say, the World Bank and this kind of thing, and more recently yeah. has, I think, had a bit more of a revival. So I was wondering if you could maybe uh, characterise for us a little bit the debates around industrial policy um, within development economics. Yeah, yeah. So I think, at, you know, at one point, um, and there were, you know, one can say there were always pro probably... Even even before development economics was was a, you know its own field or its own kind mm -hmm. of uh, uh, had a literature or was its own thing you know there was um, industrial policy infant industry type policies were, were were always kind of controversial there were always kind mm -hmm. of debates mm -hmm. going on you can go back to the kind of original uh, um, Frank like Adam Smith all right yeah <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. exactly you know, so this is a very kind of um, um, you know it, 19th century, of course, Adam Smith. Before that, right, you, you look at like you go back to 19th century. There's very strong debates in in in, in the UK and Great Britain about about um, about uh, the efficacy of industrial policy and whether this is is a pro liberal thing or, or mm -hmm. uh, a social welfare maximizing thing. Or it's it's uh, is this a politically backwards thing to do or mm -hmm. economically backwards thing to do? Um, and so so it was always kind of had controversy, but within development economics, kind of like when, when development really, economics really came into being and, and kind of became um, solidified as, as like a, a body of knowledge, let's say in the post-war, it mm -hmm. was kind of intimately tied to, indu to, 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 to industrial policy and, and development studies were kind of very intertwined. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't that controversial at the time. I think it, like at the, maybe in the post-war, and again, there's surely people who rejected it outright um, yeah. getting even even at the birth of kind of what we think of as um development economics but mm -hmm. um but yeah it was very much tied to the, the that field um in in the post-war and then and then you know um it was a robust part of the tool set of development economics thinking about how, how you know how, how do we um how do we promote industrialization or or the reconstruction of economies in, in post-war mm -hmm. Europe or, or post-war Asia Pacific and uh and and, and you know and beyond mm -hmm. and um and for many reasons um and I should also say that people were, were thinking about industrial policy and industrial development before then of course um mm -hmm. even in the interwar period but but you know it, it became part of the developmental kind of toolkit in post-war period and was synonymous with development economics but i think i think i, I and i'm giving a very cartoonish yeah sure <laughs> trajectory of it you know but but yeah. like you know like um i'd say, I'd say like like it is you know, it, it 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 was used in some very uh cavalier ways mm -hmm. and in, in ways that you know uh you know, weren't weren't always uh, successful you know and, yeah. and 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 uh and and kind of you know uh, led, led to many problems in, in, in many different contexts and had wide heterogeneity. And so, mm -hmm. um, so you'd say like the cracks started kind of uh, forming in the 60s really and really, really taking hold in the 1970s mm -hmm. uh, with, with uh, you know, I, when the neoliberal kind of consensus was really coming to an head and, and um, Really, kind of starting to define um, the Washington institutions. Yeah, and, sure. Right, and, you know, but and before the seventies, you know, industrial policy was relatively non-controversial part of mm -hmm. the World Bank's tool set. 
right? They were very much bent and thinking about things like planning, you know, things that we, mm -hmm. we would sound pretty alien today. You know? The World Bank was thinking about planning and was thinking about industrial policy and thinking about mm -hmm. optimal uh, input, uh, import substitution. Substitution, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like uh, these things were very much in, in, like part of the World Bank's, you know, um, uh, policy, po you know, uh, policy menu at that time. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Washington consensus, um, I think, had, had a very strong convincing critique that, that became dominant. And, and, mm -hmm. and eventually, maybe that's what you're hinting at, you know, be, became, to, to, to use an overly academic word, really, really hegemonic. But mm -hmm. it became kind of the dominant way of thinking about um, development policy, development practice, and really mm -hmm. rejected whole cloth uh, the legacy and practice of industrial policy um, for maybe some pretty good reasons, because mm -hmm. it, 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 there were some pretty glaring episodes where it caused some definite problems. It, there, there was surely, surely kind of uh, episodes in Latin America, surely in Africa, and but beyond where industrial policy surely led to some failures. And mm -hmm. that, and that kind of, um, you know, that, that was happening at a time when people were very much questioning the, the, the statism of development policy writ large. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, the, the, the Chicago school and, 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 and kind of the neoliberal consensus was arising just at a time when, when these glaring kind of um, uh, uh, outcomes of industrial policies and misuse were were becoming just wholly salient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So by the 1980s, this industrial policy and a lot of like the the kind of policy levers we talked about that were associated with industrial policy started become becoming roundly rejected. Mm -hmm. And that rejection became codified in, in, in international, various international law and multilateral agreements. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and its, its use was very much limited by the countries that were now joining what we think of as like the globalized world and globalization okay. with, you know, with the Washington consensus that, that had mm -hmm. given birth to it. Um, really limited the extent to which countries could pursue various levers of industrial policy. And I'd say, and I'm sorry, this is so long meandering. No, it's good. Yeah. You know, like, like, um, um, I'd, I'd say like by the 1990, by 1990, you know, people, mm -hmm. you, you, you read a lot of quotes in, in you know, the international studies, which you're probably familiar with where people are like, oh, this really just doesn't work. The industrial yeah, right. Policy. Okay. Globalization is one. Uh, and globalization and, and what we think of as the neoliberal consensus or mm -hmm. maybe more precisely Washington consensus. Um, you know, here, here's a policy menu that says, you know, these things didn't work. The mm -hmm. state probably should have a minimal impact on trying to steer the trajectory of, mm -hmm. of, um, of industrialization and growth beyond just a, a relatively, beyond a certain set of parameters. Mm -hmm. And and so industrial policy was very much fell out of favor. Um, oh, cool. So before we get to the the rebound, I guess uh, yeah. starting from maybe like two thousand five or like with China's rise, I think we get a an interesting rebound in the way we think about industrial policy. But maybe we'd, I'd just like to clarify the the period that you just described. So yeah, um, you, you said that there was sort of clear evidence, or like surely it seemed that industrial policy had led to some some bad outcomes. Um, so I guess the examples are things like um, stagflation in America, um, hyperinflation in Latin America, um, yes. just kind of wage price spirals in Africa, um, yes. that sort of thing. And, and the policies that were implicated yes. in that were things were particularly price controls, wage controls, foreign exchange controls, uh, and tariffs and that sort of thing just sort of a bunch of it seems to me like one thing that always surprised me about the discussion around the washington consensus was that uh the the countries in question that were then you know the recipients of structural adjustment lending and that sort of thing mm -hmm. were cooked in a number of ways so they 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 had these big economic crises Yes. And it's kind of reasonable to say that uh, the roots of that crisis and a kind of reasonable 
agenda of reform would be to just get the government out of um, market interventions that really had no logic to them. They were yes. mostly related to corruption or something like that, or just kind of poor thinking. Um, yes. But that the Washington, the structural adjustment lending, um, in part because they were responding to a crisis, in part because they needed to get the money back to their donors, in part because there's corruption with these institutions, that sort of thing, um, kind of went beyond just uh, getting the government out of these market interventions. It also had a lot of weird stuff, I think, like just general austerity. So like reducing spending on yes. things that I think the Washington consensus would actually endorse, like the government funding infrastructure or funding healthcare or education. Yeah. So is that my, my, is my analysis kind of broadly on target there? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're right. Um, I think, I think industrial policy, like things like capital controls or the you know, parastatals, mm. you know, controlling um, oh, yeah. certain commodity, you know, uh, production or commodity prices. And, you know, a lot of these like definitely can have, the Venn diagram can overlap with, mm -hmm. with what is industrial policy. But, but you're right in that, you know, tariffs, protectionism, the distortions, that, that we think of as associated with these things were very much associated with industrial policy and protectionist interventions. Um, and uh, I think, uh, and, and Kruger and, and people who had very powerful critiques from the Washington consensus side of industrial policy would say, and you hinted at this as well, which, which I think is right, is like the rent seeking, you know? Yeah. The, the, the kind of original OG kind of discussions around rent seeking, yeah. really, I, you read the, the rent seeking papers, that they're mm. really talking often about industrial policy. And yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, the, these policies are supposed to meant, be meant for industrial development. Oh, but it's, it's clearly, um, you, know, you, see, you see policymakers and administrators and technocrats um, not doing technocratic things, but mm. uh, allocating policies in, in completely coherent ways that are, are um, politically self-serving or, or mm -hmm. serve some political purpose, not some kind of technocratic pro-growth, pro-industrialization mm -hmm. uh, agenda, but that are very much rent-seeking in, in their objective. Mm -hmm. And so, so that was very much um, part of the Washington consensus. And, and it definitely does dovetail, if I, if I get the point right, with like um, the crises that happened um, through the 1980s, um, that, that really retrenched a lot of industrial policies, structural adjustment lending, structural adjustment policies were, were, were I think, understood, giant understudy packages that had a lot mm -hmm. in them that I feel like we haven't fully unpacked. Like at least I, I, I say we as in like mainstream economists. Yeah, yeah, mean, yeah. Like they did a lot of stuff. And um, a lot of that was to kind of um, retrench industrial policy. But I, I, I agree too that like, they did a lot more than that as well. And um, yeah, so, so I, I, I definitely agree, but I, th I, think, um, I think structural adjustment and was doing something like really interesting that we, I feel that haven't fully understood it. I, I feel like we haven't fully understood its imp impacts in a way that, that I feel are um, um, uh, rigorous and, and kind of, stand up to kind of empirical scrutiny, um, you know, using today's kind of empirical techniques. I think sure. there's okay. a, lot, a lot of work to do there that's interesting um, um, because of the kind of mm -hmm. know, policy levers and, thing, and kind of conditions that you, you mentioned, I think are really interesting. So could you describe them a bit, please? Like, what do you mean by the Washington consensus? What is structural adjustment lending? And what was some of the kind of, what was the fallout from that? Because I. I suppose broadly, the consensus seems to be that even if the Washington consensus had a lot of smart, like sensible policy in it, the structural adjustment lending was mostly a disaster or like it didn't have the outcomes that they intended it to have. Um, what's structural kind of your take on it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think I think of like um, structural adjustment as kind of like something that was going on uh lateral to maybe even downstream from what we think of as the washington consensus which is mm -hmm. uh, I, well, actually you know, no, no, I, sh I should back up because temporarily you know washington consensus can be associated with like um uh the washington kind of think tank mm -hmm. um 
establishment, you know, uh, into uh, the intellectual community of like think tank, Washington DC think tanks mm -hmm. kind of getting together and, and coming up with um, what they think of as like, yeah, uh, kind of, uh, a kind of, how should I say, coming up with a menu of like, what is best practice? Yeah. What is best practice? Of course, through the lens of, of, um, neoclassical economics, mm -hmm. or, um, I think, one can say in a rigorous way and in an in intellectually defensible way, mm -hmm. neoliberalism, yeah. you know, what, what is relatively defensible? And so people often cite John Williamson's you know, a Washington mm -hmm. think tanker came up with this, this you know, 10 point list of, that is usually very much associated with, and I think is a good representation of, mm -hmm. at least from my vantage point of the Washington consensus, like things like we need fiscal discipline, we need, um, competitive exchange rates, we need trade liberalization, thus mm -hmm. kind of the relaxation of, we need to kind of get rid of um, the policy, again, the policy levers that are usually associated with industrial policy. We need to get rid of these things and we need broadly liberalization, privatization, um, deregulation, and, and kind of a focus on property rights. You know, mm -hmm. the, the list is, is, is essentially some, some, you know, a 10 point list is essentially that. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and and so, and so th this is kind of this kind of gets solidified around the same time that that this structural adjustment policies are also um, um, coming into being mm -hmm. and, and also being uh, pursued by um, multilateral institutions uh, as a response to some of the crises that are happening. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I think first in Ghana and in, in the early eighties, and oh, yeah. across also across across uh, Latin America, where um, where people are trying to think about. Okay, what is best practice? What is the best development practice? And I think you know, I, um, I myself am not politically on the same page, but I think that people probably did have. Mm -hmm. We're trying to be maybe sincere technocrats and sincerely yeah. believe this truly. And you know, what, what is you know, given what's happening in this kind of intellectually in this emergent thing that we think of as the Washington Consensus. Um, I think of a structural adjustment as kind of codifying that mm -hmm. as a response to the crises that are happening across the developing world. How do we get these countries, say the Ghanas of the world, out mm -hmm. of the situation they currently find themselves in? Yeah. And um, structural adjustment really started codifying these rules. And, mm -hmm. and, and because the Washington Consensus is very much multidimensional, um, the structural adjustment loans, the conditions being put on these kind of bailout loans to mm -hmm. these foreign economies are very are, are quite varied, and, and uh -huh. have I think I, I think have um, an amalgam of responses that we don't quite understand. That I think mm -hmm. are that were at one time by economists accepted as largely successful. Oh, but right. I think that is I think that is up to controversy, and that's something that, that you hinted at. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's actually not. I think like the average effect of structural adjustment. I, I wouldn't even feel comfortable like characterizing it because I, I think it's so complex. Because mm. like, what is the effect of these like, very multidimensional things that you're imposing on a country? It's like mm -hmm. very a mid crisis. Yeah. And so, um, so for me, I'm 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 probably um, I'm probably not like many development mainstream development economists where I'm like very skeptical of generalizations of structural adjustment as being <laughs> broadly positive. Okay. Um, um, which probably diverges from the mainstream of, of probably the world you're coming from, which is which is development studies, which is, is rightly, I think, pr with good reason, very critical of structural adjustment policies that, that existed and that were implemented um, uh, even until fairly recently. I suppose I'm fairly sympathetic to the, the struggle that the lenders had um, in that situation. And I, I'm also yeah. sympathetic to how ignorant we were about development policy and corruption and the kind of institutional explanation for a lot of the issues that they were facing. So I don't yes, uh, yes. rage at the institutions. I think I was more um, referring to, I'm reading an article by probably Danny Roderick, um, just arguing that all the countries that receive structural adjustment lending pretty much today um, are still kind of in the doldrums and don't yeah, seem to have yeah. really organise themselves. I think an interesting... Um, Maybe exception to that is Indonesia um, yeah. and generally some of the Southeast Asian countries. So they obviously had this, these big IMF bailouts in the, um, in the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s. Yeah. 
um, that's often seen as, as kind of structural adjustment lending 2.0. Um, sure. And I know that Indonesia in particular was really scarred by that experience. Um, and as a result, uh, the Southeast Asian nations set up um, the Chiang Mai Initiative multilateralization, which is like a currency swap facility, um, yeah. so that in the future they wouldn't have to call on the IMF again um, yeah. because they were so yeah. pissed about it. And I, I mean, it, a kind of hot take on that is that, well, that's kind of exactly what the IMF wants. Like, oh, you're going to take fiscal responsibility. Uh, cool. Uh, 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 um, and so, like, in a sense, yeah, yeah. if if that experience of a sort of fairly painful restructuring leads yeah. to institutional reforms um, yes. that mean that the IMF doesn't have to step in again, maybe from a very long run perspective, that's exactly a, like a good outcome. That's what you want. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what your your take on that is. Or your reaction? No, no, no. I think I think that that's like I think that's an interesting analysis, and I think um, one. Well, I, I'm fairly sympathetic to. Um, um, I think where my where my hesitance with the effects of the Washington consensus are, it's like I see. Um, how do I say this? It's like I see all these empirical studies that that give you so just such varying answers to this. Uh, in fact, there's a famous paper that uh, refers to it as an empirical blast knot. Yeah, the, right. the, the, the effects of liberalization writ large, of which we think of these policies as kind of funneling liberalization through, mm -hmm. um, you know, conditional on receiving these structural investment loans and this lending. Um, it's, it's, they're doing so much that it's economic consequences. Um, for me, are so hard to read because oh, yeah. they're just so varied, so heterogeneous. And I feel like we haven't... Mm -hmm thought about these things rigorously enough insofar as their average effects that I'm always so, um, I'm, I'm more referring to kind of people, people in my camp who, who mm -hmm. and, and the way I took it, the development where these things were largely seen as, oh yeah, it's kind of it pretty much worked. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know what that means. And, yeah. um, but, but like, I think, I think like um, institutionally, like, like the dynamics you talk about are, are like, yeah, no, that, that seems that seems like a pretty reasonable um, analysis of, of what happened mm -hmm. institutionally, um, and so and so I guess I'm I'm and also what I'm referring to too is I, I don't know what to call it. I think there's been this revival of um, new neoliberalism. Have, have you encountered this? Like, oh, I don't think so. Do you mean like the kind of um, pro house building people, like that sort of thing? Yeah, because I, mean, I would class exactly. myself as neoliberal of that variety. Oh, I am, I, <laughs> yeah, I, am, yeah. I am like, you know, um, very much, yeah, no, I yeah. am, in, in that sense, like, it's like, yeah, but, like, I think broadly there's this kind of um, people, you know, being, being I am pro-neoliberal and, and um, painting this whole experience as broadly successful mm -hmm. and kind of erasing the nuance of it and reading, I think, what they want to out of this experience. I think, I think there's, I think a lot of this happening is actually broadly cultural. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and an odd line, and like an, uh, very much an online artifact. And, and also is very much um, based in, from kind of U US think tankers yeah. and, and, uh, and, and people from people who were not subjected to uh, yeah, yeah, codified sure. neoliberalism <laughs> and, you know, like, uh, um, yeah, so and, and it, it, a, a very kind of odd alternative history of what I think of as of what neoliberalism was, and and okay. very little engagement with like uh, structural adjustment lending, mm -hmm. for better or worse. Um, I think some people are sincerely engaged with the people like uh, William Easterly's. Yeah, um, I think insightful kind of um, revisions that, that are are optimistic about what structural adjustment did successfully. Um, from like a sincere, I think, political or, or, or empirical perspective. It's like, well, let's let's revisit this with the best tools we have. Well, it looked like it was on average, um, maybe successful in some crucial ways or some other papers that say that as well. Um, but I, I myself think the story is, is much more um, uh, subtle and, and, and we haven't arrived at a conclusion. So okay. I guess my, my, my stance is very much of like, oh, there's this kind of new, intellectual kind of popular intellectual wave that is is kind of recasting 
neoliberalism as a broad stroke success where I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, were just, we were just, we were just kind of like um, getting to a point where we were kind of like interrogating this in, I think, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a nice empirical way. What, what is, what is this consensus in some way that, that we um, are so fond of? And so, yeah, yeah the, the, I don't know if that explains the, the Yeah, yeah, it does. That's interesting. Yeah, and yeah. so where do you think the, the academic discourse around industrial policy has gone since then, yeah. like, I guess, in the last 10 years or so. Yeah, so kind of, like, picking up. So, like, Washington consensus, I guess I'll lay out, like, kind of, like, in broad strokes, kind of yeah. what, what, what happened in industrial policy after this? Well, I think we stopped measuring it. We stopped kind of studying mm -hmm. it as an artifact, like, as an empirical object of inquiry. Mm -hmm. And countries still kept using it. They kept calling yeah. it different things. Uh, and kind of, it, it's its implementation was very much limited under things like the Washington consensus we talked about or structural adjustment policies, but countries kept using it. Mm -hmm. We just kind of accepted, I think in academia that, okay, these, this, this is a, this is, this is, um, this is a non-issue. This doesn't exist anymore. This, we know right. industrial policy doesn't work. Let's move on to other things. Mm -hmm. But the world kept, you know, that, that's a kind of academic dialogue, but the yeah. world kept using it. And, and, and maybe calling it different things and using it in ways such that it comported with um, uh, the international legal system that, that kind of um, embodied globalization. Mm -hmm. It still accommodates industrial policy in some ways, in some, in some subtle ways, and countries still surely deploy it. Like countries like China surely deploy mm -hmm. it. And so right as it was rejected, and you hinted to this as well, there are countries surely starkly using industrial policy mm -hmm. and also having success. Yeah. A huge example being China. Uh, mm -hmm. Vietnam might be another one. Yeah. Who we're, we're surely using these policy levers uh, in creative ways, in ways that were very much inspired for, by what had happened in East Asia in the post-war. Mm -hmm. Another set of you know, the, the, what we think of as newly industrializing economies. Yep, the tigers. Yeah, exactly, yeah. who used industrial policy rather successfully with heterogeneity um, mm -hmm. to, to industrialize very rapidly. And China surely adopted that template. And, mm -hmm. and, and Vietnam surely did as well, along with kind of uh, uh, a pragmatic mixture of other policies that were surely also pretty liberal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that so that, that, that kind of like challenged, I think gradually kind of challenged, well, is, is industrial policy really this thing that doesn't, this is necessarily a failure? And then we have things like the financial crisis and we have things that, that kind of start um, whittling away at the various pillars of the Washington consensus, which we thought was a, a broadly this thing that we, that was empirically defensible. And so you know, as the empirical revolution in economics occurs, as the empirical revolution spreads to development economics, mm -hmm. Suddenly, I think that, op and as kind of crisis happens, the, the global financial crisis and other things happen, um, I think it gave the latitude and kind of gave the space, again, along with uh, China and the trade wars that came associated mm -hmm. with China, it kind of gave the space for people to kind of once again start thinking, well, Let's now let's let's analyze this. Did industrial might industrial policy actually be more subtle? Might it have some co-developmental effects rather than being this thing that's necessarily um, um, pernicious, that's necessarily deleterious, that's necessarily like uh, anti-development? And so, like you like you hinted at around the early two thousands, um, people who were challenging the Washington consensus were at large also started thinking. Well, or also kind of started kind of questioning um, the consensus around industrial policy. Okay. And, and other things like, like, like things that you hinted to before, like things like capital controls. Mm -hmm. And suddenly people started cracking open the data and thinking, well, maybe the experiences around industrial policy are more varied and subtle than this Washington consensus had previously converged upon. Oh, maybe, okay. maybe the effects are much more subtle. Maybe, maybe this is something that we can study and accept um, and kind of take more seriously as not something that is necessary due to fail, but actually something that might have some uh, 
pro-development consequences if deployed properly. And okay. like Joseph Stiglitz, um, those, those you mentioned, Danny Roderick, and, mm -hmm. and those within, I guess, the heterodoxy of economics. Mm -hmm. uh, ha Jin Chang, who was always quite bullish on the policy, mm -hmm. this kind of discourse kind of came uh, to a head in, in the early 2000s. And so this question of industrial policy as this thing since their failure mm -hmm. started kind of flipping. And I think what happened you know, post, you know, like post financial crisis that, re that really ramped up, mm -hmm. um, and then Trump, na economic nationalism, all these things came to a head. The Chinese trade war came to a head, and that really amplified the mm -hmm. discourse around industrial policy. Oh, this country surely doing this. We're having a trade war over now in the U.S. Yeah. And, like we, we need to take this probably pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. And that that kind of like really amplified it. And that they came back to a head where I think eventually economics as a discipline couldn't just reject it as this thing that just doesn't happen. It's sure. Just, yeah. And so have economists developed any sort of paradigm for thinking about in this new age how to differentiate between kind of bad or dumb industrial policy and industrial policy that might have more of a pro-development effect? There, we're trying. I think a couple of people like it's. It's only very recently that we've been trying to like. I think sincerely think about taking the tools of, and and we're we're talking on a um, to date the podcast. Sorry if I'm dating the pod. You can edit this. Out. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to date the pod. You know, today the people who won the Nobel Prize were were people who kind of led the empirical revolution in economics. Mm -hmm. Economics became very data driven. Yeah. Started Who won the prize? Uh, I have not been up on the news. Yeah, um, um, David Card. Um, all right, okay. Yeah, Wido Embins and, and Josh mm -hmm. Angris. So okay, yeah, all right. So very much the empirical turn um, masterminds. Yeah, okay, cool. Sorry to interrupt you. Keep going. No, no, no. no. I'm surprised I'm... they didn't give one to Kruger posthumously if if they yeah, gave it to the other three. Pretty fair. Yeah. I thought that yeah. Pretty, um, um, but anyway, let's not get yeah, bogged no. down in Nobel Prize discussions. No, no, no. But like, you know, so, so it's like, like that happened. And so I think only recently have people been kind of porting, like myself and other people, been kind of port those tools over to thinking about, well, what's dumb industrial policy? What's not dumb industrial policy? Because I think, um, sadly, the discourse or the converse, I, I, I should stop saying discourse, the conversation on industrial policy, I think, doesn't really differentiate those two things too well. Um, All right. Okay. Both, both on, uh, from the perspective of people who are very much vehemently opposed to industrial policy, no matter what, mm -hmm. and people who are, I think, yeah, I, I'm very much sympathetic to industrial policy and mm -hmm. it's, 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 um, its potential. But I think there's a lot of people who are um, very cavalier about it necessarily always working. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where I think, well, that's, that you should probably be cautious there. And to that end, I don't think we have... We're, I don't think we're necessarily at a point where we have the tools to really differentiate between the two mm -hmm. or have like an agreed upon tool set that allows us to distinguish like between dumb industrial policy and not dumb industrial policy beyond maybe the obvious, like what Trump had done mm -hmm. like in response to China, w let's protect a bunch of stuff in, in the kind of most knuckleheaded way possible. Yeah. Um, let's try to revive dying industries that, that mm -hmm. will probably never come back you know, that like prima facie is is like is like probably dumb and dumb. yeah <laughs> like, you know, like, like, like just just at, at like just first glance oh this this is like a non-starter and so, yeah. so maybe we do have a way to differentiate dumb, dumb yeah whenever i read lighthouse's comments on trade policy i'm always like do you have any idea what you're talking about like how can yeah. you be this confounded if you've been working on this for 30 years like you've got baffling. it fully backwards yeah <laughs> baffling. baffling like people saying just crazy stuff about yeah. about yeah yeah um which was like a really strange place to be post 2016 yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah very yeah. strange a very a very much a throwback so i think i think uh to your point like that would be pretty mm -hmm. dumb industrial policy and, and countries are doing it and um so but i you know that's to say i don't think we have like um like i don't think we have like a toolbox that allows us to kind of we have a toolbox in economics that's like this is essentially like oh any intervention is always going to be 
the conclusion of any intervention is, is like probably always pretty bad. And yeah. so through the lens of those tools, um, some of which are not quite empirical, that you know, the, their conclusion might be, well, a lot of things are dumb industrial policy. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and of course, Trump's policy would fall under that set you know, mm -hmm. with these analyses. Yeah, sure. But I think um, the problem is a lot of these tools don't accommodate for industrial policy to actually have positive effects. And that's, that's, um, that's an issue. Sure. So um, let me run my understanding of what uh, I guess the World Bank, as I understand it, sort of advocates for nowadays, because um, I'd be interested in your, your take on it from this, this nuanced um, empirical point of view. So I know that um, Justin Lin and some of his co-authors have been pushing this idea that uh, development, economic development is broadly around following your comparative advantages as it organically shifts. So yeah. in a very low stage of development, your comparative advantage is low skilled, but voluminous labor. So you want to specialize in garments and this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then as you reinvest the proceeds from that in education, health and infrastructure, you'll be able to move up to, you'll just naturally your wages will rise as a result of being more skilled. Um, and so your comparative advantage shifts and then you move into like light electronics or something like that. And this mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. kind of repeats itself. Um, and that process of comparative advantage, you don't want to like get really in there with a crowbar um, the way kind of old industrial policy works. Like maybe yes. you don't want to put tariffs on the next um, sectors that you're going to move into. You want to let the market tell you what your emerging comparative advantages are. But once you have got that initial market signal, um, then there is a role for the government at the very least to correct um, information asymmetries um, and to kind of turbocharge that transition. So I think the, the example that I think is quite neat on this is the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Um, yeah. So I, my understanding is what, they, what happened there was that uh, after the Soviet Union kind of broke down, there was a kind of residual heavy industry in, yes. in Macedonia. Um, and so you had like the skills around the engineering there and that sort of thing. And you had some railway connections and power plants, like rudimentary stuff. And so some German car manufacturers um, mm -hmm. set up plants there. And then the government went to speak to the car manufacturers. So there was just a few little investments there. And that's your kind of initial market signal that you might have an emerging comparative advantage. And then the government goes and says, I don't know exactly the specifics, but like, so why did you guys invest here? Uh, and now you've got to be very careful about corruption and, and all that sort of stuff. But assuming everything's clean and tidy, um, the investors might say, well, like you've got the relevant skills, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then the government would say, okay, so like what, if we want to get more investment from you guys in similar industries and stuff, what do we need to do? And they might say, well, we really need a railway line here or we really need power plants there or something like that and it's less about sort of tax concessions and that sort of thing and more about addressing bottlenecks to scaling yes. up whatever that investment is um so does that does that all sound kind of reasonable to you is there like something missing from that story what are the yeah well yeah no i think i think like um I, i'm sympathetic to to lynn's like dr lynn's kind of mm -hmm. conception of industrial policy um that is that, that I think I think broadly the idea of using comparative advantage and, and kind of being mindful of the market signals mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a highly integrated world. Yeah, um, yeah. Something one could leverage for the deployment of industrial policy. And I think in the past, the instances where you see, at least from my, my vantage point as, as someone kind of knee deep in the data in, mm -hmm. in Asia, it's like, I think they were very mindful of this to playing to one's comparative advantage that might not be realized yet, but mm -hmm. where they have the potential to move into these markets, which are within reach, yeah. um, which he calls perhaps late, some people call latent comparative advantage, mm -hmm. that, that comparative advantage, which is not yet realized, but perhaps with investment, perhaps with FDI, foreign direct investment, and perhaps with other resources, there's the potential, um, which while risky, there's the potential to cultivate comparative advantage in these certain sectors. The point being that we don't do not want to, I, I think like like crowbar, like you said, our, our way into um, 
industries, sectors, product groups that are so beyond yeah. our yeah. Like, like so I, I worked just to sorry to interrupt you. I worked briefly no, no, no. for an Indian MP like in in, in New Delhi. Um, and uh, I was doing a lot of notes for him on industrial policy and stuff. And that was right at the launch of the Make in India campaign. And I remember reading just the absolute worst consultants report I've ever come across from the Boston Consulting Group, um, where <laughs> they were sort of outlining what sort of industrial policy the Indian government should uh, get engaged in. And the comparator nations for India um, to learn lessons from where it was always Japan and Germany. And I'm like, this is just not you want to be comparing yourself to. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, anyway. Yeah, no, no. It's like, and I think that's the state of where a lot of research is, where it's like um, very too, too broad, like just mm -hmm. super, super broad compared. I think comparative work is like truly, uh, tr truly like, extremely important, but it's like mm -hmm. very high level. It's not enough to guide you or to guide us or to um, arm a policymaker with a tool set to make technocratic decisions at a granular mm -hmm. level. I think that's where we're missing things. And, um, and therein, like, I think because of the fuzziness of our tool sets um, and kind of some of the loose thinking around industrial policy, it means that, that, that some economies pr pursue industrial policy I think in the words of, of Justin Lin, like mm -hmm. that contradicts competitive advantage. Right. Um, yeah. Well, South Korea did this. Mm -hmm. We can do this. Well, it's like, well, South Korea when? Like mm -hmm. South Korea after like two decades of industrial policy or to South Korea like post like a, a decade of um, heavy industrial investment. Like, mm -hmm. so I think, I think there is there, that's where I think his, his arguments are, some of the more, I think, reasonable around industrial policy mm -hmm. when taken th from this entry point, that like we need to be mindful of our competitive advantage um, and we need to be mindful of the price signals that tell us potentially where to aim. And mm -hmm. like, I think um, it's not just the state that's mindful of this as well. Mm -hmm. It's also the, those produced like, working in Vietnam, we see that like, foreign direct invested firms are very interested in industrial policy because they love to produce more. They love more of the, they love more um, input suppliers from that mm -hmm. domestic. So there's also like some, some private like signal coming from FDI mm -hmm. insofar as what might be industries that Vietnam could potentially move into that could support um, foreign invested sectors mm -hmm. um, yeah. in ways that are kind of, mindful of comparative advantage mm -hmm. that they're not going to jump into um you know, super 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 high-tech manufacturing for which they don't have the skilled labor force to pursue mm -hmm. um or, or or industries which like they're so far from the international frontier uh, yeah, yeah. um and of course there's people who argue that no we don't we shouldn't care about that i think and, and of course um um caricaturing their arguments, but there's there's people who say, no, we actually shouldn't be mindful of these things that, and for relatively subtle reasons, comparative advantage is something we should ignore. And, you know, so, um, okay. we shouldn't be so fixated <laughs> yeah. on that. To, to be, to, to characterize, uh, comparative advantage is something we shouldn't be so fixated on. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. So one thing you, you raised earlier was um, how industrial policy is different perhaps in a highly integrated world versus prior to a, a highly integrated yeah. world. And I just want to get your insights on this. So it does seem to me like one thing that's often missing from the commentary around industrial policy that reaches the public, like through the guardian or, or these kind of popular books or something like that is that the Korean story that you mentioned um, played out substantially. So I do guess just for everyone at home, like the South Korea is probably the most famous success study um, of, of industrial policy, along with, I guess, Taiwan, um, and, and there's a few others. And that success story played out substantially before the World Trade Organization came into being and also before yeah. the, uh, the ICT revolution, so the Information and Coordination Technologies Revolution, which was a big part of, like, offshoring and, and all this kind of stuff. So I just wondered, like, what, what role does that globalisation play in 
the transformation of industrial policy and what, what is effective or ineffective in industrial policy? Yeah, I think it definitely complicates the story of industrial policy mm -hmm. and it should kind of condition the way we think about industrial policy moving forward and what we learn about the past. Um, I think, so South Korea, I think two things to say there is that, well, well a couple things to say is that, mm -hmm. well, um, because, of, because of the patterns of the Washington census and the international kind of, um, uh, for it is like the, the legal frameworks that govern international economic activity do constrain the types of policies that governments can um, pursue. Um, not wholly, and that's something that, that does limit the toolbox that countries can deploy to pursue um, certain industrial development goals, especially very kind of targeted um, uh, granular goals, the types of which were pursued uh, by South Korea let's say in the 60s and 70s. Um, mm. That said, uh, they, you know, GATT got, got still existed and GATT did allow them, GATT got was mm -hmm. a little more permissive for countries to kind of pursue these types of things. Um, the WTO, um, they still pursued industrial policy even when they ascended to the WTO. And so, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, surely um, there's, there's a lot of, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, I don't want to say like, not a, you know not hiding industrial policy. Like, like, like I, mm. I, I'm kind of squirming because like yeah yeah like non distortionary subsidies like this kind of yeah nonsense. yeah there, there's yeah. yeah like like the, the China is accused of like uh, you know, doing all sorts of um, kind of um, backdoor industrial policy as a member of WTO. And, and countries are all of the times accused of doing pursuing industrial policy, even as members of the WTO through kind of um, channels that aren't entirely salient mm -hmm. um, because the WTO limits the extent to which you, you are able to deploy certain tools for industrial development goals. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but that said, like, like South Korea was pursuing, even, even I have a paper on this, hopefully out at the end of the year where if even in their like, supposedly liberal period, mm -hmm. um, they are pursuing industrial policy. Mm -hmm. It looks very like pre pretty interventionist, um, mm -hmm. especially by today's standards um, in the eighties and nineties. And so, um, right. but but that's yeah. They, so they mm -hmm. are they are they are still doing this stuff. Yeah, and their and green like, green industrial policy is quite muscular, as I understand it. 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 It's, yeah, it, that's it's uh, that's also a great example. And so mm -hmm. um, so. So if we think of like the internet, like globalization as the institutions of globalization that a lot of people argue don't permit industrial policy. Well, that's true, but there's important caveats where all around the world industrial policy is still pursued mm -hmm. even, even within those frameworks mm -hmm. by certain, because of certain exceptions or they're able to still deploy them maybe maybe in, in some kind of clandestine ways. Sure. Um, but like you're, you're right in the, like the global value chains, um, it, it does complicate industrial policy. And some people act as if that's probably um, a killer for industrial policy. And I, I, I'm sympathetic to that, but I'm also sympathetic to the fact that like it might not be as well because it means that hyper-specialization might also open the, the exactly, it might open the, it might open the realm, it might open the, the, the possibilities that you can become highly specialized in yeah. certain flavors of the global supply chain in which industrial policy might be deployed along with, and what we see now is in, industrial policy is deployed alongside rather like policies thought of to be re relatively liberal FDI yeah. um, with the help of kind of companies who are trying to offshore stuff who want, um, you know, a solid industrial base to pursue offshore economic activity with mm -hmm. um, and are relatively open to industrial policy for, for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, I would have said that industrial policy is almost like easier nowadays. Like in the past, you, uh, it seemed to me like the main thing was that you, you couldn't liberalize in a lot of ways because other countries still had their borders shut, full of tariffs and everything. And so you would just end up in a foreign exchange crisis, basically. So yeah, you needed yeah, to do a kind yeah. of strategic liberalization where you have some import controls and you're kind of exporting some yes. things to get your forex and whatever. Um, and so the, yeah, the pre-WTO period for South Korea, for example, was was a very complex balancing act of, of all these oh, different absolutely. 
Yeah, whereas nowadays it's just kind of like, oh, yeah, we're all liberalised. No one's got their barriers down. Forex is a lot more of a chill issue. We don't have balance of payments yes. crises every week. Um, and so now I can just kind of, yeah, look for my comparative advantage and just kind of grease the wheels a bit um, and worry a lot more about coordination. So like in Malaysia, there seems to yes. be an yes. incredible architecture around coordinating all these um, complementary industries that you mentioned before. Exactly. Um, yeah. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, I would have thought that it's it's kind of in some ways the golden age of industrial policy. It's just it's just more light touch than it used to be. Yeah. No. I think I think there is like it, it, there is some more specificity to it, and that's I think mm -hmm. where like industrial policy has to probably take a different form than it took in the past, and that well, it has to be it has to be feasible under these international legal frameworks that we're all obliged to that many countries mm -hmm. are obliged to follow, but at the same time, it has to kind of obey such a fractured global supply chain but that fractured global supply chain in and of itself doesn't preclude mm -hmm. industrial policy and some critics of industrial policy speak as if it necessarily does and that's mm -hmm. where i'm like well i'm not yeah. sure about that because sure. um because like you know there, there's some you know, uh, like one firm might white constitute the lion's share of very specific slices of the, the uh you know the, the uh, specific global supply chain mm -hmm. and that makes in that 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 gives you a pretty large target with which to kind of aim industrial policy. Mm -hmm. and so, um, so yeah, I agree that it, there is like an ambiguity to it. It doesn't necessarily rule out industrial policy. I, I actually think it makes it more um, incentive compatible in some ways because you mm -hmm. have to be compatible with an external market often um, because so